Oxford was something that always really seemed quite unattainable for me. Nobody in my immediate family had been to university. Nobody from my school had been to Oxford. How different it is from where I'm from and to, to the sense of normality here, the two are inconceivably different. It's difficult, I think, for a, a more fortunate person to imagine some have come from very, very challenging backgrounds. I used to have holes in the soles of my shoes there, um, and the bottom had kind of um, had, had worn out, basically. And I used to walk to school, and my feet would be in agony every day. I mean, the stunning thing is how, how bright, resilient, determined, um, resourceful so many of them are. I've now got two degrees. Yesterday, I actually released my debut single. You know, the thing about the foundation year is that it's completely changed my life. When LMH was first founded, it was to right a wrong that was a product of its time, where we're in terms of equality for women when it comes to education. This picture is of the first nine women um, that attended the college. Right up until 1878, Oxford was a real, real boys' club, solely for men um, to be able to get the degrees that they wanted, but not taking into consideration that maybe, just maybe, women also wanted that equal opportunity. And then now, with the foundation year, it follows along in the same spirit of that pioneering tradition of opening doors for people that previously might have been considered as if they had no place. Hiya. Make yourselves at home. We borrowed the idea of the foundation year from Trinity College Dublin. They've been doing it for about 20 years. Uh, they've got all the data to show that you can take uh, young people from very challenging backgrounds and at the end of four years, they're uh, as uh, up to speed as all the other students. The idea was to give them an extra year and say, look, we think you are full of potential, but we need to get you up to speed so that you can compete on equal terms. We're trying to fill in the, the gaps in their, in their education, of course, so we're trying to uh, broaden them, deepen them, uh, enrich them in all kinds of ways, uh, as well as academically. We're going to do this in two parts. Before we go to the theatre next week, it would be quite interesting to know something about the play that we're going to go and see. Um, and um, I thought it'd be interesting to talk about the theatre in general. If you want to take people from low-income backgrounds, uh, it's unreasonable to expect them to have the same rank of A-stars as people who've had much more privilege in their education. The difficulty if you put them into open application with somebody from a very nice school is that they're at an immediate disadvantage. So I grew up in Slough, born and raised. My parents are from a really small village in Kashmir, in Pakistan. The village that they came from was, it was quite a poor village um, and there was only one really small school. For my parents, in terms of education, it was always really important, but nobody in my immediate family had been to university. Nobody from my school had been to Oxford. For my parents, university, just the sort of the world of, of, of higher education seemed quite alien um, and foreign. Um, so, because of that, they didn't really think, they thought if I got my GCSEs and my A-levels, then that would be enough. My family wanted something that was familiar. Something that was familiar to them was working in, say, for example, in a supermarket. I, I was okay with it. It, it. To me as well, it seemed I'm, I'm not a very big risk taker. I, I don't like to really step outside of my comfort zone. Uh, it's called a comfort zone for a reason. Uh, and I think that's the way that they were thinking, so I thought that way as well.
I'm blown away every time I walk down the kind of staircase coming from my room, how amazing she is as a leader, as a, you know, inspirational to myself and I think to so many others also. You know, having a person of colour on the wall, you know, she was barrier breaking into the first female uh, Prime Minister of Pakistan. You know, it's that kind of reminder of perseverance to, to, and resilience to, to continue and to, 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 strive, to strive for excellence, to strive for, for change as well. I remember when Malala was here last year as well, someone I had, <laughs> I had looked up to. You know? And then just speaking to her, both my parents being immigrants, and then also being uh, working class <laughs> uh, from a very low uh, socioeconomic background just kind of meant that I never had those connections. I was never fortunate enough really to meet those types of people. And then to kind of be here and, you know, it to be the norm that these amazing people have walked down these corridors. My goal before coming here was to go into politics and I think being here, kind of realising the disparity in opportunity has inspired me even further to find ways to spread those opportunities and to, to kind of ensure that there's truly a quality of opportunity so more people who deserve to be here and in places like here can actually truly come here. Let's find a place for your photo, you've got to decide. <laughs> Where you want to be between? There, between. Let's have a look. Come on. Have a look. Okay. Um, okay. All right. Let's, let, let's stroll down and get stroll back up. Um, and I don't know. Um, it's got to be with Benazir Bhutto. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know. I think I don't know. Some something about that that place. Ah, let's, yeah. Right. Yeah. Just do this. Just say. Uh, I'm going to have my portrait in the hall. Mm, mm. Jeez, where, 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 where? In the hall. In the, in the where's hall. the space though? Where's the... Oh, we're going to kick somebody else. <laughs> okay. Well, as, I was, as I was trying to work out where his, his portrait would be between. Well, it depends. If you're going to be a spy, the yes. spies are down there. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> if you're going to be... We, we haven't got many politicians. Politicians, that's But lots of journalists. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Explorers. Yeah. Uh, philosophers. Yeah. Writers, yeah. historians, I mean, what, what do you fancy being? Politician, that's the... Politician. Yeah. See you later. I guess then the politics section is this, 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 this small section here. Can go next to, or I don't know how it would work, but... Uh, Prime Minister. Prime Minister Rasa Martin. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Not for the power, but for the, the, the power to change. We've taken young people from all kinds of backgrounds. Some come from extreme poverty or from family breakdown and other kinds of deprivation. It's difficult, I think, for a, a more fortunate person to imagine the, the backgrounds that they come from. The Oxford examination system, the admission system, is designed to be as fair as possible. Of course, it increasingly does take into account some of the context about their backgrounds but there's extreme nervousness about bending over too far. If you're a conventional Oxford academic and for your whole career you've just looked at, well, you know, I want people with two A stars and A, I'm not even going to look at the others, uh, it takes a leap of imagination to say, well, maybe there are people of great potential who could easily have got a two A stars and A if they had had a different kind of start in life. Now, some people, even knowing that, still don't want to take that into account. Um, but I think, I think the mood is changing, and I would say partly as a result of the foundation here. I applied to uh, Oxford normally, um, even though I had a terrible time at interviews, kind of socially, still the academic side, I saw myself in. And then I remember not getting in, and I was like, wow, like, it was, it was heartbreaking. And then when I got the opportunity to go on the foundation here, you know, I jumped at it, I, I realised, like, well, I have to, you know, this is my chance to get into Oxford. I need to take this. This kind of like desire to learn, this desire to, to, to kind of really excel in life is often, you know, it is not what we're told back home.
was the impact on education? On my education? Oh my word. <laughs> um, I think none of it I realised at the time, but uh, all of the events of the past, um, I think, massively weighed on me. And I look at my, 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 my primary school experience, um, you know, and, and the fear that was, that was kind of riddled with it. You know, lots of joy being a child, but this fear of not understanding why things are happening, um, uh, fear, fear of those around me, fear for my safety. I'm realising the realities of poverty. You know, even, even, even late primary school, you know, my mum had to just like, uh, let me to go to, to school on my own because she couldn't afford to get the bus. And you know, just things like a dyslexia test. I'm dyslexic. And my school didn't properly test me and because of that I got moved down sets and put into a class with, you know, a lot of those people are now in prison or whatever. You know, the test, if you pay completely for yourself, it's like £600. Uh, you know, my mum didn't have anything near that fraction in, in the bank. The kind of psychological effects came back later on in my life, especially in sixth form. These experiences have massively affected my, my learning, but they've made me in the person that I have become. Um, and I'm, I'm thankful for them in a really kind of weird way. I'm thankful for all of them because if it wasn't for them, I wouldn't have the perspective that I have. And you know, and no amount of money would allow me to truly have those perspectives. It didn't occur to me to apply to Oxford, sort of just, just through the normal sort of process. I've never lived away from home for longer than a week. Never been away from my parents or my siblings, or even from Slough, from my local town. I was worried about how I would be sort of, not just perceived here, but whether I'd sort of be accepted here as a person and as a student. For someone that is as, as visibly Muslim as I am, I knew I was going to stick out regardless, especially coming from an area where, for example, my school was majority Muslim. I never really stuck out there, but I knew that coming to an area that was, um, that was majority white, for example, I would, I would definitely stick out. And that was a little bit worrying because you, there's a lot of sort of, I think, um, unfortunately, preconceptions that come, for example, with wearing a hijab, with dressing as I do, with being Muslim. But I was surprised by how kind everybody was. Oh, hello. How are you doing? Very well. And we're going to talk later. Yes, we are. It's very nice to see you. And Especially you. off the course like, as well. I know, I know. Well, I'm so glad that that's all there. I never believed that I was scared of dogs before. No, I know. But this time last year. I'm a bit naughty and trying to look at a hijab. Oh, yeah. <laughs> My parents, I think they were worried and rightfully so. But at the same time, they were so excited that they sort of completely, um, they decided that it would be it would be the right decision for me to live out to get the full sort of Oxford experience. See you later. Bye bye. Come on, you. When I first came, there was definitely a lot of pressure. There are very few people of colour. Very few people of colour. Luckily, I'd been to the countryside many times, you know, and experienced people staring at me, people looking at me. It, it took a moment for me to get used to, even though I had that experience. In London, I don't have to think about my race, whereas in Oxford, the city and the university, it's a reminder every day. I remember how much I tried to adapt to it. I tried to change my voice. I tried to change my manner. I tried to pretend like I didn't come from where I come, I come from. You know, and I, you know, I hit them with it. Oh, <laughs> that's so great. It's really funny. And, da, da, da. Um, and I just realized that is so unnatural. And I caught myself. I said, actually, you know, I need to be proud where I've come from because, you know, my success uh, I, I, and how far I've come in life is, uh, it is thanks to that. And I realised actually, you know, there are people like me here. There is a place for me to be here. So these are me and my sisters, um, so obviously there's four of us. Whatever I do, it's not, it's not just about me, um, it's, it's about my sisters as well. The course itself hasn't just impacted me, but it's had really positive ramifications on my sisters. If she can go there, so can I, because they, they see themselves in me. It's not just affecting me and Ela, it's affecting me and 
three other little girls. Um, I'll hopefully, hopefully, if they want to, follow in my footsteps and just just realise that they're, they're more than capable of, of, of coming to a university like Oxford. <laughs> We completely underestimated the, the ripple effect. I was thinking in a very old-fashioned way that we, we would take a student from this comprehensive school, she would go back and give a talk and we would get a student next year. Of course, what happened is that they all go on social media and we had one or two absolute social media stars. They were reaching audiences of tens of thousands. We should check this in five minutes and see how many people have watched. Sign up now and don't miss out. And that's how instant it is. So when I got to Oxford, I saw that there was a lack of diversity and I mean, I wasn't really impressed by that because it was sending a message that intelligence has a race, it has an accent, it has a certain location, postcode, and I just wasn't going to have that. So I thought the best way for me to reach out to other people like myself across the UK or those who were interested in attending a place like Oxford was to record myself. Oh, 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 oh. channel so for today we are going to be library hopping i'm hoping to spend the entire day in the library <laughs> on how I read 10 books in about four days. And depending on that essay question, that's why it's really important to do this part where you break it down. This is how I would go about tackling my work. So it's currently 5.23 a.m. in the morning and we have approximately zero. think that the foundation year was definitely transformative. It was the catalyst of what went on to be now. From the beginning, Alan just said, yeah, of course, of course you can do this. It was unwavering, like an unwavering sense of belief in me, like, of course you can. Whereas I'd never had that before. I'd never had a teacher just saying, like, let's go. Like, you've got this, lead the way. And my ideas are heard, they're listened to, they're voiced. Like, that was a new experience. In December, I'm going to be an author. Like, I'm actually going to be an author, and that is crazy. When I arrived, I think I was one of like 35 black students in the university, and two of us were on the foundation year at that time. So, I guess there were 33, right? And then as time went on, by the time I was leaving, I think that year they had something like 136 black students. It's slower than I would like. I mean, I think that they have the power and the resources to do it much quicker and to do it on a much bigger scale. But you've got to take what you can when you can. I'd rather this than nothing. I'd be 28 by the time I finish that PhD. And I'd just be here like, oh yeah, that one's from Oxford, that one's from Harvard, and that one is hopefully going to be from Columbia. Or maybe Yale, I don't know. We'll see where the wind takes us. 
He wants one. So we could just stand about there. Okay. But it's lovely to be back, like in such a, like a familiar place, you know. My kind of interest in music was kind of sparked was when I watched my mum playing the piano when I was six. For me, so this was like the most amazing like piano playing I've ever heard in my life. I told her, like, Mum, can you teach me how to play that? And this is me, and like, never even touched a piano before. I was self-taught mostly from when I was like six to uh, 14 on piano. Hi, this is a piece I made up on the piano about when I was 12, I'm 13 now. Hope you enjoy it. to be very like self-driven and had to yeah mostly kind of pick it up pick it up myself but it was easy because I loved it. My dad was very unwell like throughout my A-levels that took a massive toll on kind of my motivation and my kind of ability to really like try and work hard on my A-levels just because home life was very difficult. I didn't get straight A's in my A-levels I got actually quite a few C's in my A-levels and the fact that I went from that to be able to get first to Oxford really shows that actually Oxford are missing out on people that actually who have the potential. And also I had, I'm diagnosed dyslexia as well which I didn't actually know until two months before my final exams about a year ago so I went through all of my GCSEs, A-levels, first year, second year of uni not even knowing I had dyslexia and I should have had extra time. So that was a massive disadvantage as well because I spent all of my education feeling really stupid but clever at the same time and I couldn't work out why. David and I, I feel like we are living proof that that is not dumbing down. David has gone on to make amazing, incredible music. He went on to get a first class degree from the University of Oxford. I've gone on to do a master's degree at Harvard University, write a book and create change for young people. And I just don't know if that is dumbing down. That is not dumbing down. If anything, that is adding to the excellence that Oxford is and is going to continue to be. And I think you've got to, you've got to have people like us because look at look at look at us look at what we're doing uh, yesterday I actually released my debut single If for Oxford to be ranked number one, it has to exclude, then it shouldn't be number one, quite frankly. <laughs> to be number one in any field, in any space, you've got to be as inclusive as you can, include as many voices as you can, because if you're only reaching out to one demographic or one kind of people, you're number one to those people, not to everybody. <laughs> people like myself, we're coming from different walks of life but we're bringing amazing ideas, we're bringing innovation, we're bringing a different story and, and adding something else to that table because I think if you're gonna have a space like Oxford where you're the place that's helping to create change, creating future leaders, to me, how can you do that when you're not involving everybody? That doesn't make sense. I don't want to live in a world that only has one kind of person. Oxford like want to look for the best, the brightest. So if they're going to look for the best, the brightest, they've got to look deeper. They've got to contextualise people's grades and contextualise people's education to see what their potential actually is. I'm an example and the many other foundation students are examples of how actually people can really thrive at Oxford despite the fact they might have got B's or C's in their A-levels, but they got B's and C's in their A-levels because of circumstances out of their control.
the stunning thing is how how bright, resilient, determined, um, resourceful so many of them are. And within 18 months, you really can't tell who's the foundation year student and who's the direct entry student. There are some who, are, who I think will go on to greatness. I mean, really, they have found themselves, found a voice at Oxford, and it will be a tremendous platform. They will go on and create, I think, a virtuous circle where they will become poster boys and girls for Oxford. And people will think, well, if people like you can get Oxford, then I can. Uh, and that will have a ripple effect over decades.